the History of Japan podcast, episode 233, A People Apart. Today I want to talk about one of those subjects that, for whatever reason, tends to get a footnote treatment in discussions of Japanese history and culture. What I mean by that is that almost every book or documentary or what have you covering Japan will mention this phenomenon, say more or less the same list of facts about it, and then move on. It is ubiquitous both in its inclusion and the relative triviality of that inclusion. Why that is, I can only speculate, but today, it's time to give more than a footnote's worth of treatment to the Burakumin. More or less every discussion of Burakumin, and I am guilty of this myself, tends to hit on the same basic points. First, that they were a social class formally organized during the Edo period to do menial or unpleasant work working as tanners, butchers, executioners, that kind of thing. Second, that the Burakumin as a distinct social class were formally disorganized in 1871 by the Meiji government. And third, that despite that reform, anti-Burakumin discrimination continues to this day. But there is, of course, far more to the story than that, so let's dive a little deeper. The Burakumin have their origin as an official social class in the early Tokugawa period, when Tokugawa Ieyasu and his successors began the process of organizing Japan's Edo-era social structure. In theory, this social structure was to be grounded in the governing philosophy of Japan's elite, though not so much everybody else, Confucianism. Specifically, it was grounded in a four-part structure that had its origins in the teachings of China's second great Confucian philosopher, Mencius. Mencius divided society into four distinct classes. First and foremost were the scholars, who, through training and study, would serve to govern society and act as ethical examples to lesser people. Second were the farmers, whose work sustained society by, you know, making the food we all need to eat. Third were artisans and craftspeople, who needed to be sustained by the work of farmers, but still contributed something to society with their specialized skills. Fourth were merchants, who in the Confucian framework did not actually produce anything themselves. They merely moved around things other people had made. Thus, they were a necessary but irritating parasite. But of course, that social structure has a couple of holes. Where, for example, do religious professionals or soldiers or, hey, prostitution is supposed to be the world's oldest profession, right? Where do the ladies of negotiable affection go? So every society, from Vietnam to Japan, that adopted a social structure grounded in Mencius's framework ended up modifying it to an extent. In particular, the Japanese framework was modified by the inclusion of a fifth classification of people. These were the people who did the most unpleasant of jobs. In particular, both Shinto and Japanese Buddhism have this very strict taboo about defilement, Certain practices are considered to be ritually defiling in a way that was religiously taboo. In particular, taboos surrounding death were very strong in both religious traditions. Shinto, of course, has a very complex notion of ritual purity. Only those who are undefiled should interact with sacred spaces or things, and death was considered pretty defiling. Buddhism, meanwhile, has a strong taboo against violence and a long history of promoting vegetarianism. These religious taboos came together to create a difficult social situation for anyone whose job involved violence. Butchers, executioners, bounty hunters, or people who just worked with dead bodies, like burial workers. Then, of course, there's the more traditional kind of defiling work. Tanners are almost always mentioned in the list of defiling professions, since leather tanning traditionally required the use of caustic chemicals found in urine, and not just any urine, but heated urine that, I am told, I fortunately do not know this myself, has a very powerful and distinct aroma. Prostitutes were also folded into this category of lesser people, despite enjoying, shall we say, a pretty substantial degree of popularity among the leading men of the age. The term used today to describe this fifth social class is burakumin, literally dwellers in hamlets. That name comes from the fact that most areas had a Buraku quarter of sorts, an area where people of Buraku status were required to live. Less politely, 
Barakamin were referred to, and sometimes still are referred to, as eta, a term meaning greatly defiled. This was, for example, the term used to describe the class in Tokugawa-era legal documents, though I'm not going to use it here because, well, it's a pretty mean thing to call someone. You'll also sometimes see English-language publications lump them in with hinin, literally non-people. However, hinin refers to non-hereditary outcasts, people who were ejected from society for committing a crime or having leprosy. Those are hinin. Burakumin are hereditary. There were also some Tokugawa-era distinctions between types of burakumin, just as there were distinctions between types of samurai, not all samurai were the same, but we're not going to get too deep into that because I don't want this to just be about the Edo-era history of the burakumin. Now, the Tokugawa government did sanction a process of social repression and ghettoization of the burakumin, but it did not conjure forth that discrimination against the class. It's pretty clear from historical records of the early Tokugawa era that many communities already had taboos against burakumin and buraku-related occupations, and that in most cases the Tokugawa edicts regarding burakumin merely codified discrimination that already existed de facto. In other words, the advent of buraku discrimination was not just Tokugawa policy. Very often, you see suggestions that the Tokugawa discriminated against Burakumin as a way to essentially scapegoat them for Japan's problems. That certainly could have been a motivation, but it's important not to forget this was not a case of social discrimination invented from whole cloth by the shogunate. Instead, from what we can tell, Buraku communities were already being marginalized by the time the Tokugawa rose to power. In particular, Professor Nagahara Keiji noted in his article on the subject that outcast groups based on a fear of some kind of ritual pollution have roots going back to the 11th century, so right around the year 1000. So while Burakumin, as a term of social organization, dates to the Edo period, the discrimination Burakumin face has much older roots. Now in terms of what that actually looked like, there are a couple of commonalities. First, the Buraku quarter of a village was often located near a riverbank or on a dried up riverbed. One of the older categories of discrimination noted by Dr. Nagahara was actually Kawaranin, literally the riverbank people. The rationale behind this comes from Shinto, where water is associated with ritual cleansing. Thus, the riverbeds would hopefully cleanse the impurities of this group to prevent them from tainting the rest of the community. Burakumin were also restricted to specific occupations associated with their social class. This was not as painful, though, as it might seem. Some of these occupations, for example, were actually growth industries. Leatherworking was always in demand, since samurai armor contains a great deal of leather to allow it to maintain flexibility. Entertainers, the equivalent of carnival workers, were also counted among Burakumin, and while that's not a job that'll make you rich, it's also one that's never going to go out of demand. Overall, the economic restrictions of the Tokugawa period actually benefited Buraku communities to an extent, because while they kept Buraku families locked into certain occupations, they also kept competition out, making life economically more stable for these communities. Burakumin also had to deal with sumptuary laws regulating their appearance in public, requiring, for example, that they wear certain colors to mark their status, though I can't find a consistent list of what those were, which makes me think it varied based on the domain you lived in. Beyond that, Burakumin communities were actually relatively self-governing. Like most non-samurai communities during the Tokugawa period, they were required to appoint headmen for their villages, who would in turn be responsible to the local samurai government, as long as those headmen provided what they were asked to provide, an executioner here, a juggler there, a nice piece of leather for your new son's armor over there, well, generally they were left to do their own thing. Life was, if not good, at least stable, but that changed with the advent of the Meiji Restoration. The overwhelming concern of the Japanese government in the 1870s was modernization, how to make the nation Western and modern in order to convince the Western imperial powers to lift the unequal treaties and deal with Japan on a fair footing. And stratified, rigid class systems did not fit with that, 
particularly ones that relegated certain members of society to an outcast status. So in 1871, as part of a series of reforms that stripped away the old class system, the Meiji government passed a law removing Barakumin as a social category and removing legal discrimination against members of that social class. So that's it, right? Job's done, episode's over, easy one, we can pack it all in. Well, not quite. Legislation is one thing, but remember, Tokugawa-era restrictions on Burakumin grew out of existing attitudes towards members of the group, and those attitudes had not changed. In much the same way that the samurai class no longer technically existed during the Meiji era, but samurai still tended to dominate the government, or that the old domains technically no longer existed, but were still practically huge factors in determining whether someone was politically reliable, Barakumin's status was technically now a non-issue, but practically something people were still very aware of. Discriminatory attitudes were aided in this case by a particularity of East Asian familial tradition, the household register system. Totally independent of government, families in East Asia have a long tradition of maintaining elaborate household registers that can, in some cases, go back many centuries. The exact practice of how this works can vary a bit between Japan, China, and Korea, but the basic principle is the same. A person's family register is stored in their family's place of origin, wherever their family is determined to be from and updated with births, deaths, marriages, divorces, children, and so forth. Those registers were and are often publicly available, so in the Japanese case it's pretty easy to use them to figure out if someone has a Burakumin ancestor. That, combined with the fact that Buraku families were often not wealthy enough to move out of what had formerly been Buraku districts, and thus it was pretty easy to figure out if someone was of Buraku background based on their home address, meant that discrimination, while outlawed, still happened plenty. And in fact, Buraku communities struggled even more because the removal of those old discrimination laws also removed the economic protections that guaranteed Buraku families monopolies locally in their assigned field. Despite all this, it actually wasn't until the post-war period, 1969 actually, that the Japanese government began to take active steps to counteract discrimination against Buraku communities. In that year, the government passed a Law on Special Measures for Assimilation Projects, which marked out certain areas as being traditional Buraku communities and slated them for assimilation, the Japanese term used was doa, by raising standards of living and providing more economic and educational opportunity for people living in those areas. And, to be fair, that was a necessary project. Many of these areas did have deeply substandard infrastructure and were economically underdeveloped. However, Doha policies that subsidized these communities were and are controversial for some of the same reasons that affirmative action is controversial among some groups in the United States. The programs are accused of unfairly advantaging a specific group of people. Also like affirmative action, DOA projects are sometimes accused of reinforcing the very discrimination they're supposed to prevent. In a rather interesting twist, the Japan Communist Party actually advances that argument quite a bit. Unlike affirmative action, DOA programs are also accused of graft and links to organized crime, with money slated to improve communities disappearing into the wrong set of pockets. I've been unable to substantiate that with any cases I've found myself, but I'm not an expert on the topic. Today, the goal of the Japanese government is simply to figure out how to make this problem go away, how to assimilate Buraku communities into the mainstream. This has proven to be a pretty difficult task. Funding for DOA programs ran out in 2002 and has been intermittent ever since, and it took until 2016 for the Abe government to get a bill through the Diet acknowledging that Buraku discrimination even still exists and that it's the obligation of the Japanese government to try and fight it. But measures to try and fight it have ended up backfiring as well. For example, DOA programs collected large volumes of data to support economic relief to Buraku communities, but because that data was collected by the government, it was publicly available via records request, 
meaning that someone who wanted to discriminate against Burakumin could use it to figure out who in a given area was a member of a Buraku community. The programs have also come under consistent fire from some in the political sphere. As I mentioned earlier, the Japan Communist Party has actually been a pretty vocal critic of Buraku Doa policies on the grounds that what matters is not truly social prejudice, because to a Marxist, social prejudice is simply an outgrowth of economic lack of opportunity. What matters is bolstering everyone's economic position more generally. This is actually a pretty common Marxist line. Some communist groups in the US, for example, have a history of rejecting movements like feminism or the black power movement as being narrow and particularistic. So government efforts to address the Burakumin issue have been sporadic and of, shall we say, mixed success. But of course, Burakumin themselves have organized and acted to improve their own social position in Japan, and we'd be remiss not to discuss that too. The first national political organization to address issues of Buraku discrimination was the Zenkoku Suiheisha, or National Leveler Society. The leveler bit meaning the members wanted to level out social distinctions. It was organized in 1922, and had most of its strength in the Kansai region, that is, the geographic area of central Japan, defined by big cities like Osaka, Nagoya, and Kyoto. The leveler's name, however, is a historical reference in addition to a statement of belief. The levelers were a political group in English history, often described as proto-anarchist, and the Zenkoku Suiheisha did have a tendency to attract political radicals that either had some anarchist or communist sympathies. However, both the social pariah status of Burakumin and the reluctance of Burakumin themselves to work with outsiders in what was supposed to be, after all, a movement to empower Burakumin, meant that the Suiheisha didn't really ally itself to outside political groups like the communists or labor unions. Early on, the Zenkoku Suiheisha earned itself a reputation as an active political group, organizing protests all over the country and opening 703 different offices across Japan, developing and circulating its own newspaper, recruiting talented activists, one of whom, Matsumoto Jijiro, would earn the nickname Father of the Buraku Liberation Movement, so, you know, he's probably going to be important, and, more ominously, earning the organization a mention on the floor of the Diet during a debate in 1923 about dangerous, subversive organizations. However, by the 1930s, the momentum of the Suiheisha started to fade. Particularly, this was due to disagreements within the leadership between members focused narrowly on Buraku affairs and radicals who viewed the entire struggle through a broader, often Marxist, political perspective and who wanted the Suiheisha to take a more openly anti-government stance. Partially, this was due to the fact that the government's desire to settle Manchuria, and that opportunities for emigration abroad were still abundant, meant that it was easier to just up and leave Japan than try to stick around and fix the country. Ultimately, what killed the Suiheisha was simply the war in China. As the draft was stepped up, in order to keep the army at full strength in its grueling war of attrition, more and more Suiheisha leaders saw themselves forced to abandon street organization for a rifle and combat fatigues. By the 1940s, the organization was functionally non-existent. When it was finally dissolved by the government in 1942, as a part of an ongoing program of dissolving political organizations more generally, well, there wasn't much of an outcry. However, once the war ended, the old leadership did not waste much time in getting the band back together. In 1946, a renewed Buraku Kaiho Zenkoku Iinkai, Buraku Liberation National Committee, was organized under the leadership of Matsumoto Jichiro, who had spent the intervening years as a member of the Imperial Diet and a member of the government-organized Imperial Rural Assistance Organization. In 1955, Perhaps realizing that the old name did not really roll off the tongue, the organization renamed itself the Buraku Kaiho Dome, or Buraku Liberation League, the name it still uses to this very day. The Buraku Liberation League remains very politically active. For example, it helped push through that 2016 bill I mentioned earlier. 
It also keeps an alternative set of statistics on Burakumin populations, alleging that the government's methodology for even doing so is very flawed, and that the government's count of how many Burakumin there even are is completely off. And to be fair, they're probably right. The government system designates certain areas as Doa communities with Buraku populations, and simply counts people living there as Burakumin. Using this rather weird methodology, the government estimates that just north of 1 million Burakumin live in Japan. The Buraku Liberation League says the number is closer to 3 million. Now, the BLL retains some of the old Marxist orientation of the old Suiheisha. At its 1957 National Congress, for example, the League resolved that, quote, Buraku discrimination exists in order to suppress and exploit people. American imperialism, Japanese monopolistic capitalism, and the government are maintaining feudalistic elements, including Buraku discrimination, in their society, as they found the feudalistic elements to be a very convenient means of domination and exploitation. Of course, not all Burakumin agree with this. Naramoto Tatsuya, the director of a rival group, the Buraku Problems Research Institute, pointed out in response that, in fact, the real issue is that Burakumin are actually excluded from being exploited by capitalistic society, because more often than not, large firms just refuse to hire them. In fact, for most of their post-war history, the biggest issue of discrimination facing Burakumin has been economic. Large industries would provide some of the best paths for social mobility with their decent and reliable paychecks, also had the financial wherewithal to investigate the class background of potential job applicants. If that potential employee was found to have Buraku ancestry, well, that application more often than not ended up in the old circular filing bin. The other common form is marriage discrimination, whereby families would investigate the background of potential partners for their children and intervene against a match if the partner was found to have Buraku ancestry. In a society where familial authority still carries a lot of weight, that intervention could be pretty decisive. Professional matchmakers, who were actually still fairly in demand until relatively recently, depending on whose numbers you believe in the 1990s, somewhere between 10 and 30% of marriages were arranged by a matchmaker, well, they have a long history of discriminating against Burakumin candidates, as well as Koreans, Okinawans, and others outside the cultural mainstream. Now, to be fair, attitudes are finally beginning to shift in Japan at large when it comes to Buraku discrimination. Partially, that's the result of campaigns by the BLL and others allied to their cause to frame discrimination cases in the press, in other words, to try and control the narrative surrounding discrimination to make it clear to the public how harmful the practice is. Partially, it's the result of the growing cosmopolitanism of Japan itself, where old superstitions around Burakumin, that their blood is somehow tainted by their former family occupations, that they're somehow inherently uncivilized, that they smell bad, these things are starting to seem ridiculous. Partially, it's the result of the fact that old family structures are just breaking down. The old family registers are just not updated as much as they once were. People move away from their ancestral villages permanently, and sometimes sever ties completely. Simply put, figuring out where your neighbor or partner or your job applicant is from is becoming harder and harder to do, and people care less and less about it. So in some ways, things have gotten better. For example, in the 1930s, about 10% of Burakumin married a non-Burakumin. Now, that's up to around 80. Marriage discrimination and investigations of Buraku family background for job employment is now illegal. Indeed, a 1995 poll of Burakumin, using the Japanese government's definition based on place of residence, found that two-thirds of Burakumin self-reported never having experienced discrimination. Yet self-reported numbers are, of course, not always the most accurate. As to the future of the Burakumin, well, it's unclear, as the future so often is. On the one hand, things do seem to be improving. On the other, a UN report from the 2000s found that, especially online, on sites like 2chan, a Japanese-only message board, you can still see a lot of very hateful stuff about Burakumin. And hey, maybe that's just the internet, but... Maybe not. 
Buraku communities also retain an image problem thanks to one rather troubling statistic. Thanks to years of employment discrimination, Burakumen make up a huge percentage of one field where your background doesn't matter quite as much. They're a gigantic proportion of the Yakuza's membership. According to one estimate by David Kaplan and Alec Dubro, some 70% of the massive Yamaguchi Gumi crime syndicate are Burakumen. In 2006, one of the leaders of the Osaka branch of the Buraku Liberation League, Konishi Kunihiko, was arrested based on ties the police uncovered between him and the Yamaguchi Gumi, an incident which has not done wonders for the perception that Burakumen are deeply entwined with organized crime. So where do things go from here? Will assimilation actually become a reality? Is it desirable? Will Burakumen communities find stability? Or is the old hostility still there, just waiting for an excuse to come out? As always, I suppose we'll have to see. That's all for this week. Thank you very much for listening. Special thanks this week to listener Nadja for donating to support the show. To join her, to find out more about this week's episode or any other episode, or to submit ideas for future episodes, check out the podcast webpage at www.isaacmeyer.net, that's I-S-A-A-C-M-E-Y-E-R.net, or our Facebook page at facebook.com slash historyofjapanpodcast. 